The Passion according to St. Mark, the 15th chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. Due to the length of this morning's reading, we're going to ask you to be seated for this part. As soon as it was morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and the scribes and the whole council. They bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? He answered him, You say so. Then the chief priests accused him of many things. Pilate asked him again, Have you no answer? See how many charges they bring against you. But Jesus made no further reply, so that Pilate was amazed. Now at the festival, he used to release a prisoner for them, anyone for whom they asked. Now a man called Barabbas was in prison, and the rebels who had committed murder during the insurrection. So the crowd came and began to ask Pilate to do for them according to his custom. Then he answered them, Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he realized that it was out of jealousy that the chief priests had handed him over. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have him release Barabbas for them instead. Pilate spoke to them again, Then what do you wish me to do with this man you call the king of the Jews? They shouted back, Crucify him! Pilate asked them, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Crucify him! So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released Barabbas for them, and after flogging Jesus, he handed him over to be crucified. Then the soldiers led him into the courtyard of the palace, that is, the governor's headquarters, and they called together the whole cohort, and they clothed him in a purple cloak, and after twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it on him. And they began saluting him. Hail, King of the Jews! They struck his head with a reed, spat upon him, and knelt down in homage to him. After mocking him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. They compelled a passerby who was coming in from the country to carry his cross. It was Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus. Then they brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of a skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided his clothes among them, casting lots to decide what each should take. It was nine o'clock in the morning when they crucified him. The inscription of the charge against him read, the king of the Jews. And with him, they crucified two bandits one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by him derided him, shaking their heads and saying, Aha, you who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests, along with the scribes, were also mocking, mocking him among themselves and saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. Let the Messiah, the King of Israel, Come down from the cross now, so that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also taunted him. When it was noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. At three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, My God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, Listen, he is calling Elijah. And someone ran, filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a stick, and gave it to him to drink, saying, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. Then Jesus gave a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now when the centurion, who stood facing him, saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, Truly, this man 
was God's Son. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord. If you didn't know it already this Palm Sunday, let me tell you again. You're all a bunch of losers. I'm talking about the Mega Millions lottery, of course. Okay. Last I heard, three people now stepped forward and won the $640 million prize. But you're not the only losers. So is St. Mark. Since every time there's a lottery, someone always comes up to me and promises me that if they win, we will get 10%. Now, according to my calculations, divided by three, that should be a roughly 21 million bucks. And so you can imagine my disappointment this morning at such unfulfilled promises. I was really pulling for those of you who played. And if you feel excluded in any way, I'm sure Pastor Scott would be willing to counsel you and get you through this time of exclusion. Well, exclusion is a part of our way of life, and it's especially so, becoming even more so for Christians. And we see exclusion on multiple levels in our culture. Just to share you a kind of an interesting example, at a local level, at least for me, I had such an encounter one day over at Sam's Club early in the morning. It was two weeks ago, last Friday, it was the day that the new iPad was being released. And since I had a membership over at Sam's Club, I thought, why stand at Best Buy when there's only two other people here with me at 7 in the morning? So we went inside, and sure enough, they had the, you know, the, the shiny boxes of the new iPads lined up there. And, and so I paid my money, and I got mine. But I noticed that when the clerk handed me my shiny new box, it was uh, crumpled up and kind of, kind of smashed at the bottom, all right, kind of crushed in the corner. And I just wasn't comfortable with that. And I saw they had a ton of them, so I said, why don't you just give me a nice box that has not been dropped or mishandled? So the guy was very nice about it, handed me a fresh, clean box, no creases, nothing had been crushed. Well, the guy standing next to me was also waiting to get one. Could not miss on this opportunity, of course. Apparently, he was somewhat perplexed by my request to have a different box. He wasn't bothered that an electronics box might have been dropped or mishandled. And so, Kind of with a big smirk on his face, he leaned over to me and said, uh, I'm a psychologist. You should see me. <laughs> My jaw dropped. And two seconds later, I shot back. I said, well, sir, I'm a Lutheran pastor. You should see me. <laughs> and, uh, all of a sudden, that cocky smirk turned into a look of horror, and he shot back, oh, no, I won't. <laughs> and he turned around and took off. Never saw him again. Now, you can imagine, I was absolutely crushed by his rejection, but my iPad was not. So. Well, at the national level, Christians are facing exclusion by growing numbers of activism on behalf of atheism. Last Sunday morning, I took out my fresh new iPad and I turned to the USA Today app and there was a story. And I'm going to share just a, kind of a piece of that from you because it fits in so well with what I'm talking about today. Let me share it with you. It wrote, about 20,000 atheists gathered within shouting distance of the Washington Monument last Saturday for a reason rally, hell-bent on damning religion and mocking beliefs. A full pantheon of demigods of unbelief kept a crowd of all ages on their feet for more than six hours and counting. I left before the band Bad Religion was set to play. British scientist and full-time atheism rabble-rouser Richard Dawkins was the headliner. They whistled and cheered for his familiar lines such as, I don't despise religious people, I despise what they stand for. 
And then Dawkins got to the part where he calls on the crowd not only to challenge religious people, but to ridicule and show contempt for their doctrines and sacraments. The article goes on and says, Outrage was the parlance of the day for many of the speakers, including David Silverman, the Reason Rally organizer and the president of American Atheists. He reveled in the group's reputation as what he called the Marines of atheism, as the people who storm the faith barricades and bring unpopular but necessary, as he said, lawsuits, calling for zero tolerance for anyone who disagrees with or insults atheism. Adam Savage, co-host of Mythbusters on the Discovery Channel, also was there and said, there really is someone who loves and protects him and watches over his life, he said, it's me. The next day, the American atheists held their annual convention in the Washington suburb of Bethesda. Their theme, come out, come out, wherever you are. Now, if you're like me, reading something like this is a real head-scratcher. But then again, resistance to Christianity, and I think to all faiths, is on the rise worldwide. But it begs the question for me, in light of so much discord all around us, so much unhappiness on the parts of some people with Christianity, why Holy Week? Why Holy Week? Why continue to lift up Palm Sunday and the passion of Jesus? Well, I think for us, the answer is very straightforward. Because we share in this experience of exclusion. This powerful story is ours today as well. The terror that lurks behind the passion of Jesus, if you think about it, is very familiar ground to us. In fact, we can see our own reflections today in the faces of those people in those ancient crowds, those who first welcomed Jesus into Jerusalem, only to turn against him completely within a matter of a few days. We too know how to identify with the so-called saviors of this world, falling down before them in desperate gratitude, believing that somehow they'll give us whatever our hearts desire. But then eventually, we turn against them as soon as they fail to deliver the goods. Why Holy Week? Because it is redemptive to see this behavior depicted so honestly not only in Scripture, but in our lives as well. And so Holy Week is always our story about the people we truly are rather than the people we like to think we are. And yet, because the events surrounding Holy Week are genuinely about us, there will always be that urge to turn and run away, to exclude the truth about ourselves and those who embody that truth. And so the Savior who rode into Jerusalem that day intrudes into our lives the same way that a surgeon's knife cuts into our bodies. And if we're to be healed of what ails us as human beings, it will not be painless. The terrible events portrayed on Holy Week indeed ask each of us again today, are we prepared to follow Jesus through all of the circumstances of our lives or simply those that meet with our approval. You recall that Jesus did not flinch when he faced that murderous mob. He did not sidestep the terror of death or attempt to escape into some ethereal world immune from suffering and pain. Rather, he passed through those waving palm branches and marched right on with us to Golgotha, to the place of his death. And there he embraced this terrible, painful ambiguity of our human existence, leaving us with one important message for all time. Brothers and sisters, because of my great love for you, I am willing to die so that you might live. Why Holy Week? Because through it all, Jesus is still our Lord, and this is still our story. Let us pray.
Lord, as we move this day to recall the transition of joy and acclamation to one of suffering and death, we're reminded again how much our lives echo the path you walked. That we too walk through times where life seems so wonderful and at other times so hard and full of pain. Lord, may we too today remember the events of this coming week and that as we move through these days of Holy Week, as we approach Easter, we would be mindful of your great sacrifice and of our call to walk with you. As we look forward to celebrating your resurrection and ours with you someday, give us hope and joy as we endure the cross with you in these coming days. In your name we pray. Amen.